Amen. All right, y'all, would you open your Bibles, please, to James chapter 4. Uh, James 4, let's get the word open. This is where we're going to spend our time here, the last part of, uh, the last part of this chapter. James 4, we took a little th- uh, three-week break here from walking through this book of James. We did a little Easter focus, and so now we're back. We're back to it, and so we're going to pick it up right where we left off in James chapter 4. All right, y'all, listen. So here's the question that we all face in our text today. All right, this is what we're going we're gonna to be, we're hit with here. Uh, So look, in the process of planning my life, you, in the process of planning your life, uh, the choices that I make, like prioritizing my goals and and like doing what's important to me and all of that, here's the question, is do I consider God's will Uh, or is all of this just sort of my agenda? Does my life basically just consist of me doing what I want to do? making, you know, my decisions and my plans and really just sort of hoping that God's along for the ride, right? Hoping that God is on board, hoping that God will bless, you know, my choices, my priorities, and my plans, Uh, considering uh, God's word and, and God's will, like seeking it out and following God's will for your life, for my life, like it may not, may not seem like such a big deal to you, but uh, there are, there are great consequences for us, like for for planning and living and shaping our lives apart from God, apart from him. Like this is James' focus for us in chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. All right, bottom line, all right, we're, we're dealing with a warning passage here today, all right? This is a warning passage, a warning about planning and living your life sort of with God as just an afterthought. Right? Planning and living your life with sort of God on the sidelines. God's over there as a mascot or God's over there like a good luck charm for me. Okay. Um, and as usual, James is just abundantly practical for us. Right. He hits us just right where we, where we live and breathe. Because here's the deal. Like we're busy. Right. We got a lot going on. We do. We have commitments and we have pressures. Right. We have things to do. We are, are being pushed and pulled like in so many different directions all the time. We got our work pressures on us. We're trying to make money. We're trying to pay bills. We have relationships that we're working through. Like we have friends and coworkers, uh, maybe a romantic relationship that you're in or maybe a marriage, right? And then add kids to the mix, right? Throw kids in there, uh, their needs, their health, right? Their schedules, their sports and activities, all that. And we feel the pull, don't we? Like what am I gonna do? In this situation? What am I going to do in that situation? What am I going to decide about this or that? What will, you know, shape my choices and my priorities as I walk through life? Okay, like this is the context here, right? And if you're just joining us, uh, we have, we have really kind of seen this in the first three chapters of this letter. Uh, James has been really challenging the church, specifically challenging those who would say, listen, my faith is in Jesus Christ, like he's my savior. James has been challenging us to think deeply about our own lives, right? You you say you have faith in Christ, but James is saying to us, but does that match your life? You say you have faith, does it match your life? Uh, Is your faith evident Right? Is it growing? Is it changing? Is it transforming over time our, our, our works? Is it transforming the words of our mouth? Is it transforming the wisdom of our minds? Right? Uh, James, his relentless point for us, genuine faith in Christ, like this will bear fruit in the life. And so now, right, James is pressing us with the question, like, is your faith in Christ, is it evident in the way that uh, we seek out and we follow God's word and God's will. God's word and will. Right? Is there a kind of a radical difference between you and, and the rest of the world and the way that we plan and prioritize and submit our life to Christ? So, so James is about to use kind of engaging in business as an illustration here. Right, so like while we're out there like doing our thing, like making a living and engaging in relationships and we got friends and coworkers, we got all that. Maybe a spouse, maybe kids, right? Uh, And all of this like regular life, James is saying to us, wait, wait, shouldn't we be asking God, God, but like what do you want in all this? 
God, what do you want? God, what's your will? How do you want to direct my life? All right, so let's read it, all right? Just five verses today. That's what we're gonna focus on. James 4, verse 13 through 17, okay? Let's get it, you got it? All right, we're gonna start here in verse 13. Here we go. James says to us, he says, come now, you who say, look, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. He says, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is uh, your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Verse 15, he says, instead you ought to say, well, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Verse 17, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is evil. It is sin. Now, I I think uh, here James gives us like three different ways that we can approach and think about God's will. All right, three ways. Uh, Just think about like this as three different attitudes that we can have toward seeking and doing God's will. Okay, so number one, right out of the gate, I think a first attitude that we can have about all of this, uh, God's God's word, God's will is number one, we can just ignore it. (laughs) We just ignore it, all right? Uh, Considering what what God wants, Uh, how God wants to direct my life, you know, through his word, uh, direct my choices and my plans. You know, it just kind of, considering God never comes up. It just doesn't come up. I don't really even think about it. I'm just doing my thing. Doing my thing. It's kind of Christians living as sort of practical atheists. All right? We just ignore it. And then I think right here, I think James gives us, if you think about that, I think he just gives like four reasons why that is so foolish, Okay? But it's so foolish to just ignore God. All right, all right, foolish. Like, number one, I think the first reason why this is so foolish is because, number one, life is just complicated. It's complicated, okay? You can, um, on social media, you can list your relationship status as it's complicated, okay? Like, James didn't have Facebook, but he gets it. He gets it. Like, life is just crazy complicated. Look at verse 13 again. 13, he says, come now you who say, well, all right, well, today or tomorrow, we're gonna go into such and such a town, we're gonna spend a year there, and we're gonna trade, and we're gonna make a profit. Again, James's illustration, he's like conducting business here, that's the, that's the idea. But this, of course, applies to everything in life. Like a business, just like all of life, it's complicated, okay? It's complex. There's just a million variables. Look at all the planning right here just in this one verse, verse 13. We got a time frame. Right? Well, today or tomorrow, we got a location, um, such and such a town. We got a time investment. We're going to spend a year there. We got activity. We're going to go. We're going to stay there. We're going to trade. We're going to make a profit. Right? So look, so to be clear, all right, like it's not the planning that's wrong. Okay? It's not like planning, vision, uh, strategy, intentionality, purpose. Like these things are not wrong. They're not condemned here uh, at all, really. Like this is real life. Okay? Our lives are complicated. Okay, there's, there's so much to think about. There's so much for us to do, to prepare for. So look, the problem is not the planning. The issue is what's not said here. Look, in the midst of all of this, God is just ignored. Okay, we're talking about the creator, right? The designer, the one who knows, uh, the, one, the one who um, is just never, ever overwhelmed, Uh, Our God who's never confused, but he sees all, he knows all, he holds all power and wisdom. And by the way, he loves you. He loves you and yet he's just ignored. He's ignored. All right, so it's foolish. The second reason why this is so foolish uh, is not only is life incredibly complicated, but also life is just straight up uncertain. It's uncertain. Look at verse 14. He says, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. It's clear, you know, James loves wisdom literature from the Proverbs because that comes directly from Proverbs 27, verse 1. It says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. So, I mean, you see it, like these business people, they're making their plans for a whole year. They got a year laid out, but the reality is they don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, The reality is they don't know what's going to happen after lunch. All right, is that not life? Is that not life? Like how often is that our exact experience? I, I did not see that coming. I, I didn't see that. I didn't expect that. You know, uh, sometimes good. 
sometimes really bad. Uh, one phone call. Have you ever gotten that, that phone call that changes everything? One call, one trip to the doctor, uh, one comment from someone, one missed red light, one random act of kindness, one random act of violence, and everything changes. Just as life is not complex or complicated to God, life is also not uncertain to him. Our God knows with perfect clarity, like he sees eternity past, he sees the present, he sees eternity future laid before him. Right? But life is completely uncertain to us for we do not see tomorrow. We don't see after lunch. Right? So James' point, look, to ignore his word and his will, it, it's, it's foolish. It's foolish. But to pursue, like to follow him, like is to know with confidence that our sovereign God is, is leading us no matter what, no matter what may come our way. All right? So I think there's a third reason why this is so foolish that we see here. To ignore God's word is uh, God's will, it's just foolish because life is short. It's short. Look at verse 14 again. Right? He says, yet you don't, know what, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. Yeah, it's uncertain. And then he adds this, check it. He says, what, what is your life? For you are a, a mist that appears for a little time and then just vanishes. Why ignore God's direction and will for your life when you recognize just how short life really is? James is saying it's like a fleeting mist right? in the context of eternity just a breath look at I I know like if if our perspective is just focused on the here and now life might seem long if we're all we're thinking about is this you know we mark time by our birthdays of course right and we don't we don't usually look forward to getting older you might realize like the only time in our lives when people like are excited about getting older is of course when you're young like when you're young, life feels forever slow, right? And so you're always thinking ahead as, as a kid. Like if you're less than 10 years old, uh, you're so excited about getting older that you kind of think in fractions, right? If somebody asks you, well, how old are you? You say, well, I'm seven and a half, right? You're thinking, uh, thinking ahead. Uh, then you get this glory of turning 13, right? You made it to the teen years, but uh, like that's not quite good enough. You literally start skipping years. You're 14, but somebody asks how old are you? You say, well, I'm almost 16. I'm almost, you know, and then you'll kind of arrive at that signature moment. Like you become 21, right? You become 21. Let me, the words are sort of sounds like a ceremony. You become 21. It's awesome, right? But then you turn 30. Like what happened? What happened there? Okay. It sounds like, sounds like bad milk, you know, he turn. He, turn 30, you had to throw them out. You become 21, you turn 30, you're pushing 40, okay? 40 kind of pushes back a little bit, right? So you're, you're pushing 40, you reach 50, right? And then you make it to 60. <laughs> by, the time, by the time you've built up so much speed, you just hit 70. <laughs> and then you're just kind of like in your 80s, right? And then you reach your 90s and you kind of start going backwards. It's like, well, how old are you? Well, I was just 93 last year, you know? You're like, and then something amazing happens when you hit 100. When you get into your hundreds, if you make it there, you really start thinking like a kid again. How old are you? I'm 100 and a half, right? <laughs> Look, the younger that we are, right? The younger we are, like the more we tend to think that we've got all kinds of time, right? But then, of course, the older, the older that we get, man, like the more we begin to realize like, just how fast life is moving. But, but listen, that, that's nothing. That, all that is nothing because James gives us a far more like radical perspective shift here, right? No matter how many birthdays you have, in comparison to eternity that is set before us, I don't care if you're eight or if you're 80, uh, your life is as short as a vapor, a, a mist, James says, 
you know, like you go outside in Michigan in the winter, it's crazy cold, and you oh, breathe, and it's just this mist, this vapor, and where does it go? It's gone. It's gone, right? James is painting that picture for us, y'all, like that is your life. And since this precious life that the Lord has entrusted to us is in reality so crazy, brief, right? What we do with it, what we do with it, how we invest it, like how we spend this life, it matters. Like more than we could even imagine, what we could possibly imagine. Like the last thing that we want to do is waste our life. Instead, to be truly wise, is to invest this vapor, right, in that which is eternal. Like to ignore God, right? Ignore his word, ignore his guidance for our lives in view of eternity. This is the height of foolishness. Fourth, right? It is, it is foolish to ignore God's will because, here you go, newsflash, because I'm not God, okay? Okay. Guess what? Neither are you, right? You're not God. Verse 16 says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So you see it, like James connects us, like making our plans and our priorities and our decisions apart from God. James connects it with boasting and arrogance. And he calls it what it is. He says, he says, it's it's evil, um, it, it's sin. Why? Because it is the height of arrogance to say to God, hey, I have no need of you. I, I, I actually know better than you, God. I'm, I'm not interested in you or your word or your will or your ways. James writes, that as it is you boast in your arrogance. Hey, look what I've done. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Check out my mad skills. Look at me. It's like like Liam Neeson in the movie Taken. I have a very particular set of skills. Skills I've acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. I can't do the voice thing. (laughs) Apparently, like James has become aware, right? There are those who are just bragging about their accomplishments. They've done well, all while just ignoring the Lord, like, look at what my brains, my plans, my hard work, my skills have done. And James wants to remind us of the reality. Look, we, we cannot control the future. We don't have the power, right, to control future outcomes. We don't have the wisdom to see the future. See, when we propose to do so, we put ourselves in the place of God. And, and we reveal our prideful hearts. They just have no consideration for God. It is like the, like the simplest of all reminders for us. God is God and I am not. Like we need to preach that to ourselves all the time. God is God and I am not. It is epically foolish to ignore him. All right, okay, so look. So James, I think right here in these short five verses, I think he's given us really three different attitudes that we can have towards seeking and doing the will of God, right? So number one, uh, he, he says, well, we, we can ignore it. We just ignore it. And then he gives a bunch of reasons why that's really pretty foolish to do. But now, okay, second, what's the second um, attitude that we can have towards uh, God's word and God's will? Well, the second attitude we can have is that we can just not just ignore it, but we can just disregard it. We disregard it, right? It's not that we ignore it. No, like in this case, we actually do know it. Like we know God's word has been clear, but we choose to just disregard it, like to just do our own thing and to disobey. James writes for us here, verse 17. Look at it, 17. It says, so whoever knows the right thing knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Like James just doesn't give us any wiggle room here. I'm looking for it. Like where's the wiggle room? He says, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Like we, we tend to, we kind of normally think about sin in terms of sins of commission, 
Uh, what I mean by that is like doing what God specifically said don't do. Like uh, God says don't lie, but I lie. God says don't covet, right? But we covet, right? We often think sin is just simply just like doing bad things. But, but there's also these sins of omission. Uh, and I, I think that's what James is referring to here. A sins of omission, that is to just disregard what God has clearly said to do. Like, I know the right thing to do because God has revealed his will. He's revealed his word, but then I just fail to do it. I'm like, no, no, no thanks. I, I'd rather not, God. Right? James says to us, let's don't be confused. He says, it's It's sin. You know, so for example, like from our context right here, right, we have the command like to seek the Lord's will in all of our plans, right, and to follow it. But we choose, right, to just disregard and really do our own thing. You know, I, I got this, God. I got it. I, I don't like what your word says about this or that. I don't want to do that, so I'll just choose my own way. I'll choose. Uh, I'll find my sexual fulfillment in my own way. Now, however I decide. Um, I'll extend grace and kindness to some, but I'll extend hostility and hatred towards others. I'll, I'll uh, build my wealth, but I will ignore those in need around me. I will, okay, look, I, I, I'll make an investment in my own spiritual growth that's going to be a priority. I'm gonna, that's what I want to do, right? I, I want to make a priority engagement with and commitment to church and like the people of God. Like I, I want it, that's a priority for me. That's a priority for my family. You know, unless we got sports. Uh, unless, unless we're busy. Unless we got uh, other things, something better to do. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass along this nugget of gossip because it is just too good to sit on it. I, I, I'm gonna, it's like sins of commission, doing what God says don't do, um, sins of omission, just disregarding what God says. James is telling us, listen, it, it, it's the same. It's the same. So, so, so like why though? Like why do we uh, ignore or disregard the will of God as it's just so clearly expressed through his word? Why do we do this? Well, I think we've already mentioned one reason why uh, we're so pulled to this. I think number one, we've, we already talked about it, is pride. Pride, like we propose to know better than God. I think another one could simply be a fear. Fear drives this so much. Uh, we tend to fear, like listen, living in obedience to God's word, hang on, like that's gonna be very countercultural and that's gonna be hard. And that's true. <laughs> that's true. Like, like, hear me, like, let's not assume that God's will and God's way is always the easy path. <laughs> it's not. We fear. Okay, well, what if God calls me to do something outside my comfort zone? What if, like, what if it's beyond me? What if I just don't feel equipped to do it? And we're afraid. That was me. That was me. I, that's still me. <laughs> but that was me. Like when I was really like years ago when I really sensed the Lord was leading me to, to leave business. I'd been in a, a career down in Texas um, for you know, 12 years. And I just really sensed that the Lord was um, calling me, leading me to pursue full-time ministry. And... I disregarded God's leading in my life for years because I was like, there's no stinking way I can do that. I, I'm not equipped for that. I was terrified, fearful, no way. So I sat in that for years. Um, it, it's this fear that really like leads the, the upside down view that, yeah, the will of God for your life is going to be some kind of joyless misery. <laughs> that's, what, that's what God's got out for me. His will is going to be just this misery. But, but in fact, it's the opposite that is true. It, it is ignoring and disregarding God's will that leads to misery and heartache. Ignoring and disregarding God's word 
leads to guilt, shame, and regret. Every time. Every time. See, there, there's no safer, more joyful place to be than to be in the center of God's will for your life. And that just leads us right to the third attitude that we can have, right, towards seeking and doing the will of God in our lives. Yes, we can ignore it. Yes, we can just disregard it. Yeah, no thanks. Okay, but third, we can, in a very positive sense, we can obey it. We can say that I want to follow. Look at verse 15. James says, look, instead, you ought to say, well, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. What, what is that? It's, it's this humble recognition. The Lord, he is God. Right? The Lord, he is God. God is sovereign. Like, he's good, and he is in control. Right? His will is going to be accomplished. So what do I want? I, I want to align my plans. I want to align my priorities. I want to align my life with his I want to submit to him, right? I want to obey and follow God's word and God's will for my life. So really, like a, I think a foundational question that comes with a text like this we're wrestling with is, okay, well, hang on. But how, how can I know what God wants? How can I know God's will for my life in this decision or that priority or that direction or that choice? Like, how can I know God's will? Well, it's a great question. Like, how is this really practically lived out? And so, um, let me just say this. I think that the very first place we must start is first and foremost uh, to know and to walk in the will of God starts with knowing him as Savior. It starts there for all of us. God's a word uh, reveals the truth to us. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. So I have to acknowledge, where do I stand, right? When I admit, listen, I, I am a sinner in need of a savior. The penalty for my sin before my holy God is, it is death, as this text says. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's the message of the cross. It's the message of the empty grave that we celebrated last Sunday right here. Like Jesus Christ, the son of God, right? He went to the cross and he paid the penalty for sin. He died in my place, yours, right? And he rose from the grave. So this, this forgiveness for sin, it's available to us, right? And it's by his grace through faith. Not what we do, not our accomplishments, our, our, our plans, our priorities, not our doing all the right things. No, we don't put our faith, our trust there. We put our faith and trust in what Jesus Christ has done for us, right? He died in our place and he rose from the grave in victory. Uh, John chapter one, verse 12, it says, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become, look at this, children of God. Knowing God's will starts by knowing him personally, right? As your Lord and as your savior and as your father. This is where we start. So look, with Christ as savior, with the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit within us, uh, discerning God's will in all of our plans and our priorities and our decisions, what do we do now? Well, I think it's helpful. I found this really helpful in my life is just to simply um, to apply three checks. Three checks. Uh, what's the choice I'm thinking about making here? What's the decision I feel like I need to make? I feel like the Lord's calling me to go this way. Like I'm gonna set this as my plan. I think it's helpful to do three checks. And number first, number one, we're gonna pray, right? And then we gotta check God's word. Let's start there. Check number one. Cover it in prayer. Right, and then check God's, God's word. What I mean is, what does the Bible say about this choice? What does the Bible have to say about this decision? What does the Bible have to say? You wanna know God's will, you gotta get our Bible open, okay? God speaks to us through his word. It is the Bible that reveals who God is, right? The Bible reveals his character, his ways, his commands, his guidance for our daily lives. The word of God reveals truth and error. 
the word of God reveals what to pursue, right? And what to avoid. So look, so, so anytime we plan and prioritize and make decisions, it's only wise to start with this first check. <laughs> start with, let's check God's word. It's so like whatever I believe I'm called to, this action to take, this direction to go, what does God's word say about that? So then the question is like, is it aligned with God's word? Is it aligned or is it directly opposed? So let me just say like any plan or decision that goes against God's word, I can know, okay, this is not God's will. This isn't God's will. This isn't the direction. Okay, second check. Second check would be to pray. <laughs> We gotta keep covering this in prayer. And then check number two is I gotta check my motives. I gotta check me, right? What I believe I'm supposed to do, perhaps it's not counter to God's word. It's not counter to it, but I gotta check my own heart. Am I doing this, this step, this plan, this decision? But you know what? But, but my motives, are they sinful? Am I doing this from a place of pride? Is this a decision based on fear? Is this a decision based on selfishness? A good thing done with selfish motives. Look, I can know this is not God's will, at least not now, not, at least not until I get my heart and my mind aligned with God's heart. Okay, so third check. Third check, I'm gonna pray, cover it in prayer, right? And then check with the people of God. In other words, in other words, seek wise counsel from, the, from others whose faith is in Christ, others who you trust, right? Who will seek the Lord's will and wisdom and guidance with you. You say, all right, hey, look, here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I'm thinking, okay? Uh, I, I think the Lord may be leading me to do this or the Lord might be leading me to do that. Uh, what do you think? I wanna, I wanna ask you what, do you, what do you think? Look, I need you in my life. Right? We need one another. I need my Christian brothers and sisters because here's the thing, I can be blind. <laughs> I can be really blind. I may not see clearly because we all have blind spots, don't we? Like, so ask, ask. Uh, do you see this aligned with God's word? What are you seeing here? Like, can, can you check my motives? <laughs> right? What do you think about my heart in this thing? Uh, will you love me enough to speak into my life? Will you pray with me about this? Okay, so we need one another. So we're gonna pray and we gotta check God's word. We gotta pray, I gotta check my motives. And third, we gotta pray and I, I gotta seek wise counsel. All right, now once we've done those three checks, what's next? What's next? Well, last, after those checks are complete, what are we gonna do? We're gonna pray. We're always praying, right? We're gonna pray and we are going to step out in faith. Pray and take a step. Take a step. All the while, my posture before the Lord is like this. Not like this. I'm doing it, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold a posture like this before the Lord. Uh, Lord, I'm asking you as I take, out, take this step here, God, I'm asking you to lead me. I'm asking you to direct me, okay? Uh, please do it. Right, the most important thing for me, Lord, is that you guide me. So if you need to close a door, Lord, please close it. If you need to open up a door, God, please open it. Guide me, God. Would you give me courage when it's hard? God, would you give me faith when it's dark? Please, Lord, give me wisdom to see and discern your will because my desire is to follow you. Oh, I trust you. God, I trust your lead. I trust your commands and your direction no matter what. Uh, God loves you. God is not in the business of deceiving you. We don't have to become paralyzed. We don't have to become overwhelmed and fearful of what is to come. That was me, right? Struggled there for a long time. But I, I, I'm, I'm learning, I'm trying to learn. <laughs> I'm trying to learn this with you, okay? We don't have to freeze up. God loves you like a good father who loves his children. He loves to help direct our steps. He loves to guide us in love. This is our father. 
right? And you know, Jesus himself anticipated our, our struggles with this as we follow him. He anticipated this, and I think uh, Jesus summed it up like this in such a beautiful way. Uh, Jesus said, Matthew 6, 33, he said to his followers, he said, but, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek that first. Okay, uh, this includes <laughs> what we're talking about today, right? Seek first his will. Seek first his word in your life, right, and follow him, right? Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek his righteousness in your own life. Look, and then check it. And then all these things will be added to you, right? He will supply, right? He will provide, right? He will direct, right? He will show. This is the promise from Jesus for us. So are are we seeking first these things? Or is God a uh, afterthought, sideline? a helpful mascot over there. You know, we gather around uh, the communion table, the Lord's Supper here. We do this uh, once a month, right, in order to remember the time that Jesus did the same with his disciples. Think about that moment in the upper room, Jesus with his disciples. These were men who were about to step into God's will for their lives, and it was not gonna be easy for them. Right, they're about to step right into God's will for them. Jesus told them around that last supper what he was about to do. Right, they struggled to understand, to grasp right, his coming death and the resurrection from the grave. Right, but Jesus promised in that upper room for those disciples, he said, I will be with you. He, he promised, and listen, as you follow my word, as you follow my will, Jesus promised them, I'm going to be with you. He took the bread and the cup and he made a new covenant with them, with us. See, we we come around this table, the bread and the cup, because it's the gospel in pictures for us. See, the bread represents uh, the body of Christ. God did something that he had never done before. The son of God, he left heaven and he took on flesh. Jesus was fully God and he was fully man and he came for a purpose You see, the cup then represents the blood of Christ that was shed for us. Again, Romans chapter six, verse 23. Yes, the wages of sin is death. That's what to do to me, right? But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Forgiveness. I I just pray we never get over this, y'all. May we never get over this truth. Forgiveness for sin is available to us. Right? It is by God's great grace through faith. Again, not in us, but in what our Savior Jesus Christ has done for us. So listen, if you've placed your faith in Jesus as your Savior, you've admitted your, your sin and your need of him and you turn to Jesus Christ, say, Jesus, you are my hope. You are my living hope. You are my answer for my sin debt. You paid the price for me. If your faith is in Christ, listen, I invite you, like participate with us. The Lord's Supper, it's for you.